UK um, and in fact to the first event of the day. We're obviously online this year, but we hope to do this in person, fingers crossed, next year. Mm -hmm. The first event of the day is the Gothic in Crime. Um, now, just to give you a little bit of information about me, I'm Margaret Murphy. Um, I'm one of the founders of Perfect Crime UK, and I've written 15 novels, 10 of which are psychological suspense. And some of those do have a fairly gothic theme or, or tone to them. I'll be chatting for the next 40 minutes to Ellie Griffiths and Rhiannon Ward and uh, talking about the gothic in crime fiction, both historical and in modern crime. There is a chat section, so if you want to add comments, all you need to do is click on the little chat bubble and you should be able to uh, put your comments and questions in there. We'll get through as many as possible. It's quite tight, so we we'll just do our best. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we do have giveaways today. Um, I'm giving away two copies in Kindle of Darkness Falls, which is probably one of the more the gothic themed novels um, that I've written. And um, Rhiannon Ward is giving her very first novel, which has a, a darkly, I would say almost Victorian gothic tone to it. And it's called The Quickening. So um, if you want to pay, take part in that, all you have to do is mention it in the chat section. Oh, Ellie, you want you want yes, to donate? Say, I'm happy to give away a book. Um, I could give The Stranger Diaries, which is my most gothic. I guess. Okay, brilliant. So The Stranger Diaries um, as well from Ellie. And uh, again, you just have to put your, your name in there. We'll do a lucky dip at the end and we will pick those names out of a hat and let people know by email if they have won. I have to say that it's for the UK only because of the logistics of getting them out to people. Um, but hopefully, you know, a lot of people will, will have a go at that anyway. So the origins of the Gothic in crime from Poe and Wilkie Collins to Conan Doyle. And we're not looking just at that. We're looking at modern Gothic. And, and why it is that we continue to be fascinated by those Gothic themes in our fiction, even in contemporary fiction. Ellie Griffiths, you're the author of 13 Ruth Galloway novels and five Stevens and Mephisto novels. Both have Gothic tropes. And in particular, I think um, the Galloway novels have often a sort of mystic and even an occult theme to them. So you've got quite an experience in this. Um, can you tell us why you think that we are so fascinated by those Gothic themes in even in modern writing? It is interesting, isn't it? Because we are so fascinated by, by, goth, by the Gothic still. And I think it's, I think it's a lot of things. I think it's, um, and you're right to say there's definitely a Gothic theme in the Ruth books, particularly in the sort of North background in there. And I know that, that in, in Rhiannon's books written as Sarah Ward, there's this as well, the sort of countryside and the folklore and things like that. But also Stevens and Mephisto, because I've been thinking quite a lot about how theatrical the Gothic mm -hmm. is. And they're all these sort of, you know, Bram Stoker, of course, was uh, he was a PA to, to Irving, wasn't he, or something, but he knew lots about acting. So how, so I think even in theatrical books, there's a lot of Gothic. I think we love to be scared. Um, but I think we, and we, we love the unknown. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about the unknown and the uncanny. But I also think there is a slightly comforting feeling about Gothic novels. And I think it's a lot of, um, and that's certainly true in, the, in, in uh, Rhiannon's Wonderful, The Quickening, they're these strong female characters and uh, sense of sort of female agency and empowerment. Um, but also I think sometimes we feel quite quite at home with them. And I'm thinking one of my favorite books of all time. I don't know if it counts as a uh, Gothic, but it's certainly a, um, a satire of Gothic. It's Cold Comfort Farm. Oh, and I'm just wonderful. thinking of, um, and I think of Harbin Decor in The Stranger Diaries and in my most recent book, um, Postscript Murders. And I was thinking the character she most reminds me of in the genre is Flora Post. You know, and I think sometimes when you have that still centre of, of, a, of a gothic novel, the sort of character who is just, we, we feel safe with them and is the sort of sensible voice who says, um, well, actually, Cold Comfort Farm isn't a beast waiting to spring. It's 
the farm. Um, so I think that is quite comforting. But yes, I think the, the, the Gothic will always fascinate us as the unknown always does. Yes, brilliant answer. Um, and Rhiannon, you're well known for a contemporary series um, under a slightly different name um, with DC Childs. And I think you've got four of those out. Um, but you really went all out with The Quickening, <laughs> which is quite recently released. And it, it, as I said earlier, it has an almost Victorian, even though it's not really Victorian era, it's slightly after, it has a very Victorian Gothic feel. So what do you think is so seductive about that to readers? I think the Victorian era is sort of the origin of the Gothic, isn't it? So all the tropes that we have, the, the, uh, the, the, the country house crumbling and the women in peril and the, the predatory male all started with the Victorian Gothic, really. So um, I think uh, that's quite seductive in terms of how it influences uh, modern, modern Gothic uh, novels. So if you think of something like Sarah Waters, The Little Stranger, many of her many of the, the Victorian Gothics can be found, can be found in that book as well. Um, and I mean, Ellie's books are brilliant in, in terms of landscape and uh, that always features quite uh, strongly in, in Victorian Gothic. Where I live in Derbyshire, it's very um, atmospheric. I mean, it's really cloudy and dark out there. And Victorian Gothic has um, started partly in, in Derbyshire. So we've got Bram Stoker's Lair of the White Worm is set in Derbyshire and Sheridan Le Fanu's Uncle Silas, when 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 Lefano was trying to find somewhere horrible and unwelcoming to send his protagonist, he sent them to, he sent them to Derbyshire. So um, we, we've got a sort of strong Gothic tradition where I live. Yeah, yeah. And and why did you decide to set it in the past rather than not in the modern day? Oh, I really wanted to write a historical novel. So uh, my, my 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 contemporary books always had a split timeline. So I was going back and back and back. Um, so my last uh, one was set in the 1950s. And if you go back any further than that, you can't make, it's really hard to make contemporary people care about a crime. So really I had to just go historical. Um, so, um, and I wanted to do um, something sort of post First World War because we'd have the centenary and there was a lot out there about the sort of impact of the First World War and how it society changed. So um, I went to, uh, I did a lot of research about um, the, the impact of the First World War and of course the Spanish flu epidemic, which then, <laughs> you know, it was released during, uh, during our own pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are echoes even today. I mean, as Ali was saying earlier, uh, you know, that, that we're, we're still, we're, I mean, on a, on a windy, cold, dark night, if the lights go out, we're all spooked. So we still have those feelings even if we can rationalize um, and, and you know it's it's it, it does add atmosphere doesn't it really adding those those sort of gothic elements to the books and um, what's the first gothic story novel or film that you both remember I, I was thinking about this because you, you said you might ask that and I remember it exactly. Well, I remembered it when I thought about it. It was Mid Midnight is a Place by Joan Aitken. Have you guys read that? No, it's no. such a good book. I love Joan Aitken and the, the books had wonderful, wonderful illustrations as well. But it has all the gothic elements. There's, there's an orphan living at Midnight Court, you know. Nothing ever is good going to happen if you live at a place called Midnight Court, is it? Um, I think I must have drawn on that in my children's book, Girl Called Justice, you know, and she's driving across the the, um, the moors to this awful edifice that is her school. So he, he lives in a place called Midnight Court, but then through some sort of awful machinations of fate, uh, loses all his money and is sent to work in a factory that, that really uh, sort of echoes Dickens' blacking factory. It's just the most amazing book and it's very gothic. And it has that particular gothic theme of fear of industrialization, I think, you know, and that the dark satanic mills and certainly something I draw on in the Stranger Diaries for the old cement factory. So I think that is something that runs through Gothic, isn't it? It's almost a nostalgia for sort of pre-industrial days. So anyone who hasn't read Joan Aitken, I absolutely <laughs> recommend her. Brilliant. Uh, Sarah, do you, do you remember your I do. It was a book. It's not that well known. It was called Leo Possessed by a writer called Dillis Owen. Um, and, I, and I had a look on Amazon. I've got a copy in, in my attic. I would have would have shown it you, but I couldn't find it. Um, and it's going for £80 on Amazon. But it was a... Um, 
it's a sort of that classic um, trope of um, a family who've been forced to move from one house to another and um, the, 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 the protagonist is very um, dislocated from her new environment which is sort of a trope of lots of children's fiction and um, there's a ghost, a female ghost in the house and the character is transitioning from being a child to a teenager. Um, so it, it was a sort of young adult book when there weren't really young adult novels about. Um, so Dillis Owen's um, Leo Possessed and it's a really, really great book. And I was absolutely obsessed with it. I remember in my um, first year uh, at high school, we all had to say our favorite book and I brought it in and, no, and nobody was impressed at all because <laughs> everybody had, you know, much better, what they considered much better books than, than than this sort of gothic novel. Yeah. yeah did they go on to be best-selling writers, Rhiannon? No. So, hooray for Leo Possessed. Um, do you both regard your, your writing as genre-bending, or do you think it fits neatly within the gothic tradition? I'll start, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask Ellie, because I know you've been giving this some thought, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I don't know that my work fits exactly into the gothic, but then again, I think gothic literature is quite genre bending in itself, isn't it? Because there's often this strong romance, romantic uh, storyline as well, which I think you do get a bit of in my books, particularly in the Ruth novels, which as you said, Margaret, there are 13 of them now, and there's an <laughs> ongoing kind of romance in there, as well as quite a lot of spooky stuff. Um, so I think, I think in, in a way, I think it does fit in with the genre, but the genre itself, I think, is quite genre bending because you do get uh, you know elements of crime novels and you do get elements of horror and you do get romance as well so i think within that i think it does fit brilliant uh, sarah I think it's re what's, what's really hard is to write something new when there's a supernatural element. I think M.R. James said all the ghost stories had been written in the sort of 1920s. So it, 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 in terms of sort of, uh, Ellie's completely right, in where Gothic, you can mix all the elements and make it something really, um, really new. But the supernatural element, I think is quite interesting in terms of you tend to sort of, um, look what look at the part uh, the past and, and other writers and see what's been done and try and sort of follow in that tradition so I, I, as well as it being a gothic novel the quickening I do feel that I'm sort of following in the tradition of the English ghost story um, so M.R. James and um, Edith Nesbitt and uh, Robert Aikman that sort of thing I love as well the supernatural element because yeah. that's something we haven't really talked about yet is it in Ellie's books um, in the Ruth Galloway books there's always a sort of slight there's, with the landscape isn't there um and very much with your with your your, your first book first book as well yeah def definitely that there, there is that yeah there is a sense of the landscape itself kind of being and and, and you're in your derbyshire books too landshire the landscape itself being sort of a character and sort of mm. um ghost ridden you know and uh, norfolk is like derbyshire is absolutely full of ghost stories and <laughs> and well mr james was sort of drifting that way himself wasn't he yeah, um yeah. you know full of ghost stories and and folklore and it's an absolute you know it's an absolute godsend to a writer really yeah i wanted to ask you both about because you you've mentioned already um rhiannon the 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 derbyshire um setting and, and how that has um, spawned quite a lot of stories and and also Ellie um, the area around the fens and, and where you set your books and you, you actually set them over quite a large area really don't you and, and how you tap into that folklore. Um, Sarah could I begin with you? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've used, we've got a lot of caves in Derbyshire, so I've used caves in, in, in a couple of my novels. Um, in fact, it's, again, it's carrying on the tradition. So Conan Doyle wrote a short story, The Terror of the Blue John Gap, and it's about this sort of creature that's living in the Blue John mine. And so, again, it's, it's in that tradition of using the landscape. So caves are naturally spooky. I mean, they're, they're, they're scary anyway. Um, but also, um, I'm, I'm really interested in industrial revolution architecture, which we've got loads of here in the Peak District. So things like deserted mills, old railway tunnels, it, it, it's, it's sort of all got that sort of, um, you see it in Ellie's books, you know, the liminal feel to it. It's sort of crossing places between one state and another. And I think a lot of deserted industrial revolution architecture really plays into that. Yeah. Yeah, um, and certainly you use that in uh, The Stranger Diaries, which is the first Harbinder core, didn't you, Ellie? 
yeah, definitely the, the old uh, abandoned um, uh, concrete factory, which actually is, is there near Stenning in, in West Sussex, does actually exist. But yeah, Rhiannon's quite right. There is this sort of, you know, f fear of industry and those. Also, I think um, those sort of, there's something about an abandoned place that was once full, isn't there? Mm. That's why abandoned schools. And, and I've actually been thinking a lot about abandoned hotels and the Gothic. Because um, I'm just rereading actually for, for the book that I'm writing at the moment, which is the sixth in the Brighton in the Brighton Mysteries, which is called The Midnight Hour, which now I'm thinking is possibly even influenced by Joan Aiken as well as by the song. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've been thinking about how spooky hotels are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you think of the beginning of, of, of Dr when Dracula is showing Jonathan Harker around the castle, he's almost like a sort of gothic Basil Fawlty, isn't he? Sort of showing it <laughs> round this sort of hotel or, or like the proprietor of the Bates Motel. So I think there are sort of modern gothic um, uh, settings, aren't they? Hotels, schools, hospitals. Airports, airports. Airports. Are, airports. Deserted oh, airports are really scary, yeah. Fun yeah. fairs. There's that <laughs> wonderful photographer who specialises in those awful grinning crown, clown faces from abandoned fun fairs. But, but just to go back to your earlier question, Margaret, certainly um, for me, Norfolk, yes. Uh, and as, as Rhiannon says, it's liminal. It's on the end, isn't it? You can't go further than Norfolk. Well, only 9,000 years ago, it was still attached to Scandinavia. Mm. But for the last 9,000 years ago, you can't go any further. It's been occupied for such a long time. The oldest human footprints outside Africa were found in Norfolk. So there are layers upon layers of history and folklore. And I've told the story before, so I'll just say it very briefly, but it was a chance remark of my husband's, um, who's an archaeologist. But you might actually be able to see him in the garden. He seems to be <laughs> pruning, a, past. pruning a tree out there. But anyway, he's an archaeologist. And he first made the remark that prehistoric people thought that marshland was sacred because it's neither land nor sea, but something in between. They thought of it as a link to the afterlife, neither land nor sea, life, neither life nor death, a liminal zone, an in-between place. And that's why they buried bodies there. So it's all that that, that that really has inspired me in my books, I have to say. Yeah, and caves had a similar function. So people lived really? in them and they buried people there. Yeah, yeah. And of course, prehistoric people went to a great deal of trouble, didn't they? To go a long way into caves and paint on the walls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and let's talk a little bit about those, um, those transgressive elements that you both touched on already you know the 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 ghosts and and the weirdness and and changes in belief i think as well the cultural limits the scientific advances that were going on in the the beginning of the gothic uh, literature era era um and you know class sexuality the definition of real if you like how does that apply to your own protagonist now i'm asking you to talk about Hobinda on the one hand, and and your your character, um, I forgot the name, Louise, <laughs> Louisa, um, in uh, the Quickening, Rhiannon. Um, yeah, so um, Louisa is a photographer, so um, I wanted um, her to be a working woman. All my, all my sort of ancestors worked; the fem the women worked. So um, it was really important to me that she that she had a, a profession, um, and photography is ideal because it's got that scientific um, element. So I, I talk about how the, the, the dry plate photography, but it's also got that supernatural element as, in, in as much that you can capture or possibly capture elements of the supernatural on the, on, on the dry plates. So um, it, was, it was a sort of perfect sort of fit really for what I wanted to write about. But talking about sort of transgression from, from the characters, it's quite a, a difficult balance because when you're writing historical, because in the 1920s, women, women had some freedom, but they didn't have huge amounts of freedom. And it's trying to fit a character in what they're able to do in that period, but still makes it relevant for a modern woman or man or woman, but in particular a modern woman to identify with. So Louisa um, makes decisions um, about, in, especially in relation to her romance, that would have been quite, um, uh, you know, sort of quite shocking in the 1920s. And I felt I had to really sort of spend time um, explaining why she does that um, so that a modern woman would would read it and believe it but also emphasize that you know 
women didn't have as many choices as we have today really so it, it's quite a difficult balance I think rather than when you read a book in the 1920s that's gothic because you know what the, what the, what the, the social mores were then. Yeah and, and in fact she, she breaks a lot of rules she's heavily pregnant mm -hmm. when she goes on this rather difficult uncomfortable journey mm -hmm. but she's very determined that she wants to develop that career and of course I mean even up until the 1950s it was it was considered really unusual and a bit a, a, a bit wrong actually for women to have careers a lot of women had to give up their careers once um, once they they'd had their first child didn't they yeah and, and her being pregnant was quite important because I wanted when she sees things I wanted people not to believe her and you know women when they're pregnant they're, they're sort of like you you know you're sort of you you're, you're, you're making it up um but it, because I haven't had any children I kept having to ask friends you know when she's running down the garden it's like could you run at eight months pregnant <laughs> or, you know, and what were you eating and so on so it, it was interesting research but it was it seemed to fit in with, with the story the fact that she's about to have a baby yeah and it just yeah. adds to the tension so much Rhiannon I mean I love Louisa she's an amazing character but I was so worried about that baby <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to give too much away but it, for me it just increased the tension and you know I think you did that so well and you know yeah I, I had twins and I can't tell you how huge I was <laughs> and, and you know Margaret's right I think people were quite shocked I went out of the house at all you know <laughs> so I, I did so worry about her I'm not saying anymore but I really did well, can we come to Harbinder now? Because she is transgressional in another sense and in a very modern sense, isn't she? I guess so, yeah. I mean, uh, Harbinder is, she's the, the, the detective who appears in The Stranger Diaries and in The Postscript Murders. Um, yeah, she is. I mean, she's a, she's, in some, she's a character I hope has a lot of agency. And we've talked about characters in sort of... Um, uh, gothic novels, female characters having agency, which I think is one of the really fascinating things about them, really. Even in Dracula, so to keep going about Dracula, I've just been rereading it. You know, Mina actually has quite a lot of agency in it. Um, but yes, but uh, Harbinder is uh, from a British Asian family. She's Punjabi Sikh. Uh, she's gay. She's, so she is in some ways um, a bit of an outsider. Um, she lives at home with her parents, in, uh, although she's in her 30s. Uh, she isn't sort of formally out to them. So in some ways she is, and I think she probably does feel a little bit uh, of an outsider, and that sort of comes out in the books. But also I do think in another sense, she is very much the sort of Flora Post uh, voice of reason in the book. And in, in the Postscript Murders is kind of uh, four main characters um, and starts when, a, when an elderly woman dies and no one thinks there's anything strange about it. But it turns out that this woman is a murder consultant to those those very sinister breed of people called crime writers <laughs> so, and, I, and I think all four of the main characters are kind of outsiders so there's Natalka who's the, the, the Ukrainian carer there's Benedict who runs the coffee shop who's an ex-monk um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about monks and Catholics <laughs> generally in Gotham because that's something that was a big influence on me as a child I have to say brought up as a Catholic suddenly realized wow we're super sinister and the, the fourth, uh, the fourth person is is Edwin, who is um, an eighty-year-old gay ex uh, BBC um, radio presenter. So they're four very different characters, and I think all outsiders in their own way. Brilliant. I, I do like that idea, idea of the outsider because really Louisa is an outsider too. Now I'd want to get to this question before it disappears. Um, Daniel S says, "I often find the end of a lovely summer evening very unsettling and melancholy." What role do you think the weather and the seasons can play in creating a gothic atmosphere in a story? Well, it's such yeah. a great Sorry, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, Rhiannon, you go ahead. Just yeah, it's really interesting because you know, the sort of heat and the sunshine isn't necessarily associated with the Gothic. And yet I lived in Greece for five years and there's something unrelenting about total sunshine all the time. And uh, in fact, uh, Daphne du Maurier touches on it in Rebecca, doesn't she? Because at the start um, they're on this, I think it's a Greek island, isn't it? But, um, and she's going back in the past. And again, it's that unrelenting sun. So I think heat and sunshine um, can be very gothic as well but of course the classic cloth gothic tropes are um, dark and misty and uh, well, in my book it's snowing so there's a, there's a sort of snowy element to it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I always think it's quite strange at the beginning of uh, Rebecca, which is a wonderful book, you know, they're doomed to a life of sunshine and <laughs> it sounds quite nice, doesn't it, really? And in the recent TV adaptation, they did, it was kind of like a happy ending, which isn't quite what's in the book. But no, what a great question, Daniel. how beautifully put as well. I mean, I know I've been very guilty of having a storm and rain and thunder and lightning pouring down on Norfolk, which, which is a bit unfair because actually it's quite, there's a lot of sunshine in Norfolk. So I did set myself a challenge in one of the books, I think it's The Woman in Blue, to have the sort of denouement on a sort of sunny afternoon, because I thought that that would, you know, that has its own, you know, has its every every season and every weather has its own scariness, I think. I'm always really struck because my, my favourite Gothic novel, and I'm sure we'll talk more about our favourites, is The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. And my goodness, great atmosphere. But I'm always struck by the fact that Wilkie Collins, that house is very near the station. It's it's there's lots of good communication. It was quite modern. <laughs> yeah, it made it very, very scary. So I do think you can make anything scary. And I'm at the moment reading Ruth Ware's One by One, which is um, really good. I'm in the middle of it, but it's it's in a ski resort. And my goodness, she makes skiing very scary. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Well, it's scary anyway, because it's high <laughs> yes. up. <Bad>. Yes. <laughs> um, so coming back to those, the, the origins of the Gothic, um, are you, you've said you're, you're a fan of Wilkie Collins, okay. Um, what about Conan Doyle and, um, you know, the, the other contributors? Would you say that those are the ones that you would always go to or are there any obscure um, writers that you would go to, Rhiannon? Yeah, I, I'm not sure they're obscure, but because I grew up in the North, um, I was really into the Brontes as a, as a teenager. Yeah. So Jane Eyre, I absolutely loved, Wuthering Heights. I mean, they're, they're proper Gothic uh, novels. So th those are the two I particularly like. And again, there's, uh, sorry to bang on about Derbyshire, but there's a Derbyshire connection to Jane <laughs> Eyre because um, the uh, the house um, that it's modelled on, is, is it Thor Thorncroft? Thorncroft. Um, yeah, Thornfield, that's it. It is based on a house in Derbyshire, um, and Eyre is in fact a Derbyshire name as well. So I absolutely love the Brontes, and uh, they've got all the sort of gothic themes. Although I find it, as I get older, I don't know what it is, I find it harder to reread some of them because the men are just so predatory. And I've got a big thing about um, the women come, even in Rebecca, the women come across as a bit pathetic sometimes. So the narrator in, um, in, in Rebecca, I find it quite hard to read these days. Um, and I think it's just as, as, as I've got older, I, I do like slightly stronger female protagonists, really. And, you, and as I reread Rebecca not that long ago, my goodness, Maxine, <laughs> Maxine de Winter, what a piece of work. I mean, I don't think I realised that at the time. So I, I totally get get where you're coming from, Ryan, and exactly. I mean, I'm a big Wilkie Collins fan and there's definite Wilkie Collins influences in my book particularly the woman in white and the moonstone no name is absolutely one of my favorites and that's a little more obscure and there's an amazingly good quote for it which i'm not going to remember exactly but it's something like nothing in the world is hidden forever and the sand betrays the footprint that walks on it mm -hmm. i mean it's that's all there in that quotation isn't it? so if anyone hasn't read no name i absolutely recommend it also mr james dickens i love those sort of victorian ghost stories um, but to come more up to date, there is quite an obscure book that I suppose it's not really gothic, um, but I'm a big fan of the writer Nancy Spain, who's unfortunately out of print now. And she wrote a book called R in the Month, which was about murders in a um, CD seaside resort. And that definitely did have a big influence on me as a crime writer and the sort of sense of place and the sense of just after the war and, and that whole, the whole atmosphere of it. And also it's got sort of theatrical, um, uh, the, the, the sort of detective, although she's so lackadaisical, she's called Miriam Birdseye and she is a, a, a review star. Um, and uh, her, her main way of investigating seems to be to get engaged to the main suspect in every book, but they're <laughs> just absolutely worth reading. And there's another one called Cinderella Goes to the Morgue. And I just recommend you look it up just for the cover, which is <laughs> amazing. So yeah, Nancy Spin, I'm not sure she would totally be considered Gothic, but there are definitely Gothic elements there. Brilliant. And, and Krista says, thank you. I thought I was the only one who thought Rebecca was weak. 
um, Victorian Gothic writing was very much influenced by a, a, a time of turmoil in, in a good way um, over that period. Um, lots of scientific advances. We have Darwin's theory of evolution coming up out during that time, which caused people, of course, to question their, um, their religion and their faith. Um, Locard, who is famous for uh, every contact leaves a trace and is still used today in training uh, forensics people. Freud with his, his theories on the human psyche and, and arrested, the arrested mind. And then Bertillon, who was the first person to put forward a systematic method of measuring the physical attributes of criminals for identification. Now, I wondered whether either of you were, were interested or you know, in any way influenced by that? Or is there something else that you are both focusing on in the Gothic? I, I think it's really interesting, Margaret, to highlight that, the sort of science element of the Gothic, because it's easy to forget that Frankenstein is, well, I think uh, Brian Aldiss said it was a science fiction novel. And so much of it is set in a science lab. You know, it, it is about um, science, isn't it? And experimentation and all sorts of things. So, yeah, I mean, that's very, I have been really influenced by that. Um, you know, the, my, the heroine of the Ruth books is a forensic archaeologist. And I'm very interested in the way that archaeology sort of combines both history and science and a slight otherworldliness as well. Um, but I'm also really interested in this because... Uh, <laughs> I did a, a, an MA on Victorian literature, uh, but my thesis was considered very odd at the time. Um, but it was about the fact that, um, it, it, looking back, I think it's quite prescient because it was uh, about the fact that um, detective novels arrived in the Victorian time, obviously with the Edgar Allan Poe, Murders on the Rue Morgue. And it was at the time when Victorian houses were full of stuff. And um, the, de de the detective novel is a way of finding your way through domestic stuff, isn't it? And finding clues. And you certainly find that in the murders of the Rue Morgue. I think it's the, the mystery of, of the purloined letter where he goes through every thing in the room and all these amazing sort of objects. And you get that in the woman in white in Walter Fairley's room that's just full of stuff and those green blinds that are closed. So I think that was another element of it that interests me is sort of how the, the, the detective novel, which arrived in that time, I think is, is a way, is a literary way of finding its way through all the clutter of Victorian times. That's my theory. <laughs> Wonderful. Sarah, sorry, Rhiannon. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because I guess um, the scientific element doesn't interest me as much. Um, what I find fascinating is in the crime novel, um, there's usually someone who's died and they sort of, um, however much you, 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 you write about the victim, it's that they're dead, aren't they? Um, whereas in the Gothic, you can push it slightly further in terms of what does being dead mean, really? I mean, in, in a crime novel, um, the nearest we get to it is when the voices from the dead, like Lovely Bones, it's, it's, quite, it's, a, it's a strong trope in Scandinavian crime fiction, so sometimes you have the voices of the victim. But in Gothic fiction, you can push it further, and in terms of the victim can, can talk to you or can leave signs. Um, so in The Quickening, um, it's... It's, it's appearances more, more than, than anything else. But in the book I've just finished, which is the next book, um, a Rhiannon Ward book called The Angel Maker, the ghost actually manages to communicate. And that was a, a, quite a difficult thing to sort of, because you don't want the ghost driving the plot uh, or the denouement, but at the same time, it, it's sort of exploring what it means to be dead, if that doesn't sound, sound too morbid, really. That's so interesting, isn't it? And. Um... You can see we're talking about um, Jane Eyre as well, and there's that bit, isn't there, where he call, hears Jane calling to him. Mm. And, and you can do these things, can't you, that are sort of a little bit outside the... Uh, and I, I know that, that I've been influenced by that in my books, the fact that, you know, you, you can sort of call to each other from... And, and there's the, the bit in um, The Woman in White where she has the dream of, of the wedding. Uh, um, 
uh, Anne Catherick has the dream of the way. So you can use dreams and you can <laughs> use uh, visions. Yeah. And yes, you're quite right, Rhiannon. It does add a certain element. And I think I'm like you because um, I think all crime writers are aware of the rules of crime writing, even though we do break them. But Ronald Knox in 1926 wrote these famous and sort of infamous, in other ways, rules of crime writing. And I think rule number two is no scientific element. <laughs> And well, in I, my, I, don't, with that. <laughs> I don't know what you two think about that, but I think that um, you can use it, but it can't be the, as, as Renan was saying, can't be the junior, can't be the solution, I don't think. But what do you two think? Well, I'm, I'm not here to talk about my books today. So, <laughs> so I'm going to throw that back at you. And, and it is a, a, an aspect that I really wanted to ask you both about, because in the traditional gothic detective novel the detective's role was to actually debunk those myths and you know if you if you look at um you know the sherlock holmes novels for example um there is always a rational explanation even for the weird and the i mean i've just finished reading uh, sign of four and and the weird and rather terrifying elements are effectively explained even though the detective has to go against just about everyone, including the reader quite often, um, in, in, getting, in getting the science to explain the weird and the spooky and, and the unsettling. Um, at, but Rhiannon, you, I don't, I'm not giving anything away, no giveaways, no, no kind of spoilers here, anyone, um, but you do leave that very ambiguous in The Quickening. Yeah, I, I was really keen that you know, if people didn't believe in ghosts, they could still read the book. So there, there is a rational, there could be a rational explanation to everything that's happened. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the thing I'm fascinated with is that a lot of um, supernatural sightings, um, mediumship and so on can be, um, there's a rational explanation for what they tell you or what you see. But I always think there's about 5% that is really, really difficult to explain. And it's that 5% that I'm really interested in. And if you don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural or, or, or spiritualism, um, then it's, you're going to find a rational explanation anyway. Whereas um, if you do, if you do believe in that, then, then there's ambiguity there for you, which allows you to do it. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a mixture of, I'd like people who, whether they believe or not, to be able to read my books, but also it's the bit I'm interested in, that 5% that just is inexplicable. And it, it seems like you you echoed that, or rather you, you pre-echoed that <laughs> in, in what you were saying, Ellie, um, that your, your novels always leave room for the what-ifs and, and but is it all explicable? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I definitely go along with that. I feel there has to be a scientific explanation. And you're so right, Margaret. I hadn't really thought about that. But the, 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 de the gothic detective, the detective generally, often does present that uh, rational, e even in, even in um, uh, Hound of the Baskervilles. It's a scientific explanation, isn't it? Which is so interesting. But, but to sort of echo what Rihanna was saying, there's a scientific explanation to that uh, Hound of the Baskervilles. But... It's, that's not what we remember, is it? We remember the sort of, it was the footprint of an enormous hound. You know, that's what we remember and the howls and the, and the, the Dartmoor setting. So I think it's always that bit that we remember. But I feel that, yeah, I feel we should offer, um, in, in my books, there is always a rational explanation. It never depends on a ghost. But, you know, there are always those questions, you know, did Cathbad really save Nelson in a dream realm in, uh, in a room full of bones? Well, maybe he did, who knows? Uh, and, and the new book, the new Ruth book I've just finished, which is out in February, is called The Night Hawks. And it features the, the Nor Norfolk myth, and it's a myth in other parts of the country. I think in Derbyshire too, Rhiannon, uh, of the black shark, you know, the oh, black yes. dog yeah, that speaks yeah. to you before you die. So it's about that. And there is a bit of a question in the book as to whether Ruth has actually seen the black shark. So. Brilliant. Well, I, I'm afraid we're almost out of time. Um, I just want to thank both of our panelists for the wonderful responses and, and quite unexpected responses in, in, in some cases. Um, and to all of our attendees and everyone who has taken part in the, the chat 
and there are lots of people signing up for the giveaways too. We will let people know, and there's, there's a couple of seconds if you just want to try and squeeze your name in there if you want to, to take part in the giveaway. Um, those will be sent out, um, the, the results will be sent out by email to those who have won. We will also send out an email about the panelists, their books, their bios, and their links to buy their books. And please remember that the best way to support writers is to buy their books. Um, the perfect crime, if you have friends who couldn't attend because we did sell out quite quickly on all of the events, we will be putting these online at the YouTube account for Perfect Crime UK. Do follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. We will be here next year in person, all things <laughs> going well, yes. And um, sign up to our newsletter. If you're not sure where to find them, it's all on Perfect Crime UK and you'll find all the links there. So thank you once again, Ellie Griffiths and Rhiannon Ward for a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thanks for everyone who listened. <laughs>